Thank you. I'd like to start with a prayer that we use all the time in the Byzantine Rite. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, you who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of all that is good, choir master of life, come, dwell within us, cleanse us from all stain, and save our souls, O good one. Mary, cause of our joy, pray for us. Now, the uh, plan is to uh, do a history of marriage as the Bible presents it. So we're going to have two 35-minute lectures, Old Testament, New Testament. Um, and uh, the idea, you see, is to try to see <coughs> the continuity. What holds the Bible together is the presence of Christ. Um, the fathers of the church delighted <coughs> to see the uh, presence of Christ throughout the whole of the Old Testament. The uh, mysterious figure in Ezekiel 1, the resemblance of a man, they all said, that's Jesus. Not incarnate yet, but that's present. So, what holds, though we're going to be doing this historically, what holds all of this together is the Torah, is the covenant. But you see what holds the New Testament together on this issue of others too, of marriage and family, is the Torah incarnate, Jesus Christ. And so we're going to try to consider that. Now, the presentation is going to be predominantly historical. That's what the theme is for the year in this book. <clears throat> and it's also um, important because, you see, um, the historical study can be deprived of its transcendent dimension very easily. What we do come in contact with is the flesh of the Word. The Word became flesh. Well, then the Word became history. The Word became historical. And to understand this is to catch a glimpse of the Word in both the Old and the New Testaments. Now, that knowledge can be what I call Nazareth knowledge. Everybody in Nazareth knew who Jesus was, they knew what he did for a living, they knew where he lived, they knew, but they didn't have any idea who he was. So they had a dimension of historical knowledge, but they never let that sarks of the Logos, that flesh of the Word, mediate the true identity of Jesus. So. We could do the same. We could be filled with all this interesting historical knowledge and not see how God in his mercy took this fundamental human reality and already had it reveal himself. So we're going to try to uh, show you some of that. Um, first, as I say, the Old Testament and then the New Testament. Um, there are ways that we look at this first, the uh, pre-exilic material, that is before the exile, and then the post-exilic material. The reason why that's done so often is because <clears throat> the exile was a turning point in the history of God's people for many reasons. One of which was they lost the thing they thought they never would lose. God had promised Abraham this land, and they lost it. They were driven out of it. Now, in God's providence, that was to prepare them for their multi-millennial history until they come to know Jesus. Now, they're back in the land now. I lived there five years myself. Um, there's something very profound and mysterious about that. But losing the land, losing that way of life, they had to construct it in a foreign environment and cling to it. And that's what gave so many of their practices that tenacious quality, because they needed it. And most of the material that we have in the, in the Tanakh, in the, in the Old Testament, was put together in its present form after the exile. 
though some of it dates much, much earlier. Probably the time of David and maybe even earlier. So when I say pre-exilic, I mean the material that is easily identified as pre-exilic and uh, treats of pre-exilic themes. First, um, one of the most interesting things is the story of the patriarchs has many aspects of marriage of Rebecca, marriage of Isaac, um, and so forth, where you can glean the, the notion. Already underlying all of that is the notion that marriage is directed by God. When Abraham's uh, servant goes up north to find a wife for Isaac, and he meets Rebecca, starts a theme. He meets Rebecca, as you remember, at the well. Moses met his wife at the well. Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well and proposed to the Samaritans that uh, they accept him in, in this woman. And so, uh, and then the, uh, he proposes uh, marriage. Laban, Laban is there. Laban is her brother. But we know from the Nuzi tablets, which are a collection of laws, of Hurrian laws, that in the, if the father were dead, um, the brother gave consent, but the girl had to explicitly consent herself, because he's not her father. And if you read the text closely, uh, Laban says to her, to Rivka, will you go with this woman, this man? And he, she says, yes, I will go. Yes, I will go. That's consent. And, she had, and then he, she went back uh, with the servant and married Isaac. <coughs> there are other customs, for instance, all the wives that uh, Jacob had clearly break the law. So it, it indicates that the memory of some of these great figures embellished, of course, it was tenacious enough that though they did these things, uh, they were not polished up for the, the text. They were left where they were. So we could go on. One of the interesting things about this, Sarah herself, there are, as I say, if we had time, but Sarah had a, um, a maid, Hagar. Very often, because childlessness was such a, a, oh, such a fear, because you see, marriage is to perpetuate God's promised people. The book of Genesis, for instance, there are nine lists, and they are called the Toledot, the generation <laughs> list. God's plan moves through generation. No generation, no history, no plan. And so this is so important. So, preoccupation, children. So, <clears throat> one way the woman, the wife, the main wife, Sarah in this case, protected herself was to have a maid. And therefore, if she weren't conceiving, she could give her, she could give her husband the maid, and that was counted as her child. If she didn't have a maid of that type, he could go out and get another wife, and she could become the second string wife. Now, it is interesting to notice, just in passing, the only commoner mentioned in the Bible to have had two wives was Elkanah. He was married to Hanina, and uh, Penina and Anna. Um, that's the mother of Samuel. Very uncommon. Um, so, there are other things, for instance, the, the gift, the moha, it's called. It's sometimes interpreted, unfortunately, as the bride price, as though a husband bought his wife, or the father of the boy bought the wife for the a mohar is not a price, it's a gift. And it establishes certain things. One, that the man has enough money to support a wife. And secondly, it becomes part of the girl's dowry and goes back with her to protect her. I would have, if I had the time to uh, offset some of the illusions created by some, not all, some feminist historians, uh, all of these arrangements were to protect the woman. That's what they were for. Um, it's an interesting, and not just in Israel. In the Code of Hammurabi, there is an enactment that if a man divorces his wife because she's sick, 
He must leave his house and never come back, and the house belongs to her. Because that is so unjust. It'd be nice to try that in our country. And so I could go on, but there are these glimpses you can get of the, of the Mohar offered by the servant of Abraham, uh, Hagar, the expression, I will be built up. Just so happens that in Hebrew, the word for build and the word for son are spelled about the same. So she could be saying, I will be built up through her, or I will be sunned through her. And that uh, another one of those things. But I want to move on a bit, because the next glimpse we have, still pre-exilic, are the legal texts. <clears throat> in Israel, in the Old Testament, there are five collections of laws. Not all of them treat directly of marriage, but I'll just, the first are the ten words. We call them the Ten Commandments. They're called the ten words in Scripture. God's ten words. You want to be human? This is the way to do it. Then there was the, uh, the covenant, or the code of the covenant in Exodus, which is to accompany the words. The tradition is, expressed later in Deuteronomy, that Moses only delivered to the people the ten words. And just as they were about to enter the promised land, according to the book of Deuteronomy, he added all this other material. Well, Deuteronomy laws are an updating of the Exodus laws. And one of the things that's characteristic of them is that they are very humane. First, the first addition, if you will, or application of Deuteronomic law was not that humane in the sense that before that time, only the man who committed adultery was killed. After that, the woman was too, because after all, they're both agents, they're free agents. Now, adultery in this part of the world is a sin, is an infraction of what? The husband's rights. See, the, we just had it the other day in the gospel, right? The revolution, when Jesus said, if a man leaves his wife and marries another, he commits adultery against her. That was a revolution. Because, you see, if John is married to Helen, and Joseph has relations with Helen, then Joseph offends against John because John must know that the children born by his wife are his because the whole existence of the clan depends upon that and the whole perdurance of the wealth in the clan and so forth. And so the crime is the upsetting of the stability of the clan and of the nation. Now our Lord already pointed out that the primary adultery is against your own wife. And that <coughs> was revolutionary <coughs> at the time. Then there are other, like the, I mentioned now, the Ten Words, the Exodus Commentary, the updating in Deuteronomy. Then there's the, uh, the um, Priestly Code, the Law of Holiness in Leviticus, and then the Priestly Code in the First part, 1 to 16 is a priestly code, and the holiness code is 17 till the end of the book. In those, there are many interesting things to under, we can understand about marriage. I'm going to just summarize all of that to give you an idea. One of the main things I want to give you in, all, in analyzing this is that to be a wife is a very specific legal status. It's not to be a slave, it's not to be a prisoner taken in war, it's not to be a prostitute, it's to become a wife, Laisha. She comes in. Le is the, the preposition for move into. She moves into the status of being a wife. And a, that is a, a status that's never taken from her. She could be the ex-wife. But um, by the way, there's no law about adult, about uh, divorce. It just says, if you divorce your, your wife, she can never come back to you in Deuteronomy. Well, it was, it was done, but not the way it's sometimes portrayed. And that the men, since adultery was against the, 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 the husband, the men were free to have relationships with anybody. Go to some Middle Eastern country and see what goes on over there. You know, the way these people are, you know, because of this, 
accent, the thing we've lost, the integrity of this relationship, the family, the, you see, this is what's being. I remember once standing and watching a girl sitting, standing in a, in a doorway a little while away, and I said, she looks like a little princess to this woman standing next to me. She said, yeah, but that's as far as she will go. She will never step outside that house until her father gives her permission. So you can imagine, therefore, besides <clears throat> adultery was, was, was punished by death, um, a profligate life was, was, was a disgrace, and there weren't that many women around uh, because of the way all of this was in that culture. It's not like here. You know, this was very because of the sacredness. Now, this is my first trying to show you why was it sacred. Many reasons. One, it is a share and a realization of the covenant between God and his people. In the book of Proverbs, <coughs> for instance, <coughs> um, excuse me, I don't know why I'm stuck tonight, but anyway. Um, she, the woman, the, the, the strange, the no kriya, she's called, the strange woman. But that's the same word as you shall have no strange gods. Because adultery leads to covenant infidelity to God himself. It is already a part of it. Because this relationship, as early, well, we don't know exactly how early, developed theologically by Hosea in the 8th century. This, you read that part of Hosea, where that's, you know, the relationship between God and his people is a marriage covenant only in Israel. Only in Israel. Why? Many reasons. One, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and you shall have no other God besides me. No other God made that kind of a demand. So there couldn't be this absolutely unique relationship between a people and their God because everybody else had lots of gods. But not Israel. And so the monogamy that was already implicit in the culture is raised to this higher level because of this relationship of the people to God. And this shares in it. And that's why, again, it was such a marriage was such a marvelous protected reality because it's so important. Now, so far I've only talked about the legal dimension, you know, the laws, and I've only gone through, let me just take you, well, I'll, I'll take, save that for a little later then. Um, there were two steps in marriage, but they were different than our two. The one that was constitutive was the first one. And the second, when they actually began to live together, was the completion. But the first step was when the uh, father of the groom and the father of the bride, uh, and the, the young man too, if he was old enough, worked out the mohar, the, uh, the price, the, uh, the size of the gift. And that was all agreed upon. And then at another time, <clears throat> In a beautiful ceremony, the bridegroom went to the bride's house and led her through this, the town to his own house. That explains a lot of our Lord's parables, doesn't it? Like the five virgins who didn't have it. What were they doing? See, they were still arguing about the mohar, and they all, half of them fell asleep. So by the time the bridegroom came with his bride, they missed it. And Jesus uses that image, you see, but it only makes sense if you realize the ceremony that lies behind it. The wisdom literature, which I'm going to touch on in just a moment, just speaks so often about the beauty of this relationship. And again, unique in the, in the Middle East, says things like, Son, listen to the teaching of your father and the instruction of your mother. And the word there for instruction is Torah which means instruction, not just law. It doesn't, never means law. It means Torah. It means God does things for us, and then he instructs us on how we are to respond. And that's Torah. It got to be translated nomos in Greek, and it's kind of thrown us off a bit. These are the laws. 
No, these are the instructions of our Father. This is the way to happiness. This is the way to prosperity. This is the way to have my presence realized in your life and in your family. This is Torah. And the mother, in this particular text, the, the word for the given to the father is another, but the word, the Torah of your mother. Again, unique in Israel. This uniqueness, this affection, did it always work out? No. You know, we're all sinners. There are, if you've read them, you've doubled up with laughter, haven't you? Some of the, you know, like a man with weak legs trying to climb up a sandy hill, such as a man with a scolding wife, you know, things like this, you know? Um, they're marvelous, they're so clever. Um, <clears throat> but then, uh, you see, but uh, the marriage is from God. A good house, a nice endowment, come from your parents. But a good wife comes from God. You see what I'm trying to say? That there's the flesh of the word. This is all right in the text. But it's trying to reveal something profound already about human relating, especially in marriage. Um, okay, just a few things. The wisdom tradition, because I'm watching my clock here. Um, <laughs> We haven't even got anywhere near the New Testament, much less finish the Old Testament. But um, you see, the, the general teaching of the wisdom tradition is what I've just spoken about. Once in a while, some very harsh things said about the wife. You know why? Because she is so powerful in the home. She means, you know, she is so powerful that it is so important that she understand that. As, um, one of the great psychiatrists of uh, our own day, a Jewish fella, I guess renowned, I've forgotten his name right now, uh, said the secret of marriage is that the wife give her husband, what's that word we use now? Uh, some kind of love, unquestioning love. What's that phrase we always use? Unconditional. Unconditional, unconditional respect. Because he'll fall apart without it, she won't. <clears throat> And so this is, this is uh, but that's the insight that's there in, in, the, in the text, you see. Um, now, there were, I just want to tap us a little bit of this before I move on. There were four steps in this process. Huh? There was Sha'al, you ask for the wife, that's usually the, the uh, parents. Huh? Uh, and then there's Natan, the wife is given. And then Lakah. The wife is taken, and then the last one, she becomes a wife. She becomes something she was not before. Legally, in the eyes of God's people, she's something she never was before. Now she is a wife. All of those overtones are there later on, later on in what I'm doing here, written probably earlier than some of this, in <clears throat> Genesis 2. <clears throat> There's Adam. And as you know, you know, this is all the theology of the body so beautifully done by John Paul II. It's not good for him to be alone. I'm going to make an azir, kinegdo. Uh, I'm going to make a helper, reflecting him. But the word helper there, my friends, comes 21 times in the Bible, 17 of which apply to God. This is a God, this is a divine help. This isn't, you know, I'm home, honey, what time supper, where's my slippers? That's not Azar. No. This is to make him something he could not be without her. That is, a friend. And you see, this is the teaching. And if then the later text, which is first in our, in our uh, Bible, Genesis 1, you see, let us make Adam. Adam? Yes, but not Mr. Adam and Mrs. Eve. I mean, Adam, mankind, man, whatever you want to say, in, in our image and likeness. And let them rule. You see, Adam is male and female. That's the way God made it. And it says male and female, as Genesis 1 teaches us, that we image God. 
This is again like the sarks or the logos. This is the teaching. You kind of get a glimpse. This is how we begin to understand something about God. God wants relationship with himself. And as we'll find out when Jesus finally rises from the dead, within himself. But this is the role of marriage as scripture teaches it, you see. And so, um, so we've talked about the legal tradition quickly, the wisdom tradition, just a word now about the prophetic tradition. Because this is in Israel, something went out. What did I do? Did I pull a button something? Did I? Oh, no, I didn't. It's all right. I wasn't talking into it. That was a problem. <clears throat> but you see, in the prophetic tradition, the first part of the tradition excoriates Israel for infidelity in marriage. And just list Hosea and all these prophets. Because it is infidelity to God. This is covenant. Under all of this history, there is Torah, there is Berit, there is covenant. But then they also begin, particularly with Hosea, to talk about Israel's infidelity as that of an unfaithful wife. But even in Hosea, chapter 3 is all about the restoration. In this culture, there are what they call, we, have, we all have a performative language. I christen you the Queen Mary. Bang, the bottle hits the bow, and from now on, that's the Queen Mary. Performative language, right? Or take this, I want you to have it. Performative language. In this culture, um, he, he says to her, Ishti, you are my wife. And she says, Ba'ali, you are my husband. Divorce, lo ishti. You're not my wife. Performative language. So God says to his people, Lo, I me, mean, you're not my people anymore. You're too unfaithful to me. And then in the restoration, at the place where it was said, Lo, I me, mean, it will be said again, I me. Mean. Paul quotes that latter part. So you see, then in the exilic period, I'm only going to touch a couple of points on this before I move on. Um, the legal texts are much more elaborate, but they're building on the earlier texts. Um, and of course, sometimes you just can't date them. The language is the same, the law forms are the same. So it's only the cultural milieu could give us sometimes an insight into when this was written. Um, but uh, the wisdom literature begins to develop and things that were written earlier become central and worked on again. One place particularly is Genesis 2 and 3. Not me this time. Well, you can hear me, I guess, huh? Did I? There we go. You did it. The, the wisdom, you see, the reflection in Genesis 2 and 3 is a very old part of the scripture. It was written by a group, one among a group, I'm not sure, I wasn't there, but it's a group of wise men who had such great respect for their predecessors outside Israel, who tried to come to grips with the mystery of origins. How come there's anything? Now, it's very interesting. This is an obi dictum, but you see, outside Israel, all the accounts of the beginning, the origins, is all conflict. It's always in conflict. Like Nietzsche, Hegel, Deleuze, the modern philosophers. Once you lose your grip, on Revelation, sooner or later, you're going to do the same thing everybody else has done for 50 millennia. We're not bright, and, and we're not creative, but once you lose that sense of the wonder of a God who loves us enough to just create us out of love, sooner or later, the origin of everything is conflict. And so they took what was good from their predecessors, 
but they had this burning sense of creation only in Israel. Only in Israel. You know, and that's that first you know, priestly text in Genesis 1. So they had developed this notion, and I've already touched on part of it, you see, that uh, husband and wife are friends, founded on covenant. And when they break the covenant, the, the three effects of sin, shame, the very first one, huh? fear, another one, you see? These are the basic things. And shame is what the philosophers call the limit experience. I know that there must be something, must be non-shame because I know that there's something wrong with shame. But I've never experienced non-shame because I'm a sinner and I'm born into a sinful world. But when it says, you see, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not, and it's a reciprocal verb, they were not ashamed with each other. That's unveiled communication. Nothing to hide, physically, morally, spiritually, memory, nothing. That's where we're going, folks. We're called back to that state. And in any couple who work now in the power of Jesus Christ, they can approach that. Fear, I heard your voice and I hid, and so forth. That masterful text, huh? But again, from our point of view, it's reflection on marriage. Only in Israel are man and woman at the center of all the stories, of those two stories, at least, of origins. We have Enuma Elish, uh, Atrahasis, Gilgamesh, lots of these things. And none of them are man and woman at the center. God taught them that. The legal codes, as I say, they get more developed, especially Deuteronomy, which was written later, and uh, set up, as I say, this is the stuff that Moses gave us just before we entered the Promised Land, because now we need it. Well, it's an upgrade of, or a journamento of the material in Exodus. Uh, um, was found in the temple. Remember the story, right? They were fixing up the temple. One of the good kings that Israel had, Josiah. And they found this scroll. And it was a scroll from chapters 12 to 26 of Deuteronomy. A new, another law scroll, another law code. The wisdom literature continued to develop in the lines in which I'm speaking. The prophetic literature did something very interesting. The image of man and wife imaging God and the people was used almost always, but not totally, to excoriate Israel for infidelity. That same image in the post-exilic period after the people had been suffering and, and realized their sinfulness, it's used as an image of restoration. Both between you know, God and the people you see? And it's in that context that the Song of Songs finds its place. It's written about the, the love between a man and his wife. Could be. But already do you see in Israel that that's never just a closed reality? It's always imaging God and it's always manifesting the Torah. So you couldn't possibly have something as all just about sexual love. It wouldn't have any place there. Well, you see, people have to know that sex is good. You don't have to tell Jews sex is good. They know that. You have to tell poor, mixed up, you know, Anglo-Americans, but you don't have to tell Jews that. That's not, but it's to show you the love, the fire that God has for his people. Rabbi Akiba, one of the great, he died in 135 of our era, one of the great rabbis, said, if the Torah had never been written, this Shir HaSharim, this Song of Songs, would have been enough for us. Why? Because if you really get what's going on there, you'll be won over, and you will see the Logos through his sarks. We're going to quit now and take some kind of a break. About a five-minute break. Five-minute break. Don't go too far away, I guess. And we'll start the next, the New Testament. Masterful. 
That. What's uh, that? Yeah, I don't know if that's the. It I just keeps where. coming in and out. I don't know why. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to take up a collection for sound equipment after. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't have time to touch on what's called the intertestamental period, that is between the end of what finally was included in the canonical Old Testament, uh, Greek and Hebrew, the little different as you know, and um, the writings of the New Testament. The only point I want to make there is two points, I guess, just for your own. One is the strong opposition to divorce Later on, among the rabbis, there was a saying, whenever there's a divorce, the altar weeps. Um, earlier at Qumran, there was a strong teaching against divorce, picked up from Malachi, probably, and from Genesis. Um, and one key word there, pornia, uh, pornia is the Greek for, for ervat dabar, um, and in the, in the Qumran text, in the temple scroll, but there's clearly, no, it's in the Damascus document, where people are tripped up because of this, and what they're talking about is divorce. Um, so there was a strong tendency, ratified and a much higher level by our Lord, because he went and argued from Genesis. It was not like that in the beginning. And what God has made, man must not separate. So there's a, an important body of historical knowledge there to help us understand the background to some of the New Testament. But we don't have time to go into all that right now. So what I'm going to do is just look at a couple of points. Huh? Um, first, what is Jesus' attitude toward family, particularly in founding what it been called the Messianic family. First, Jesus was born into a family. He wasn't just born of Mary, he was born into a family. He had a totally human origin in the sense of he had a mother and a father who cared for him. He was born by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, but he lived in a family. And Mary was not a surrogate womb, she's a mother. It's why she had to be immaculately conceived so that all the impact that a mother should have on the child from the moment of conception could always be there. So since she was totally a mother, and some of the, our Lord's basic images in the way he talks come from that relationship, uh, the way he looks on reality. Even his sense of humor, if you just listen to his tone of voice, it's so kind and so, he sees how, you know, we're egomaniacs and he's trying to help us. You know, if you're going to have a party, if you go to a party, sit at the bottom and maybe he'll move you up, everybody will make you look good. Do you think he came down from heaven to, to teach us that? I mean, any politician knows that. I mean, <clears throat> no, he was trying to tell us, look at the Father the way I do, and just be happy where you are. Trust me. Well, when he says about prayer, you know, they go to the lady, the woman, the, the widow goes to the judge who's an unjust judge and bothers and bothers and bothers him until finally he does justice for her. He's portraying his father. Do you think his father is going to be like that? No. But he's saying, you've got to go to him and don't give up because he's more interested in you getting to know him than in getting things from him. And if you have to keep talking to him, pretty soon you're going to get to know him. Uh, those are, there are deeper things too, but there's a gentle sort of compassion for humanity in our Lord's heart. And it comes out in these funny little things like that. Other one, was it today? Yeah, it was today, right? Or was it today? No, no, no. The, uh, the unjust steward, was that today? 
Yeah, it was, wasn't it? Right. You see our little historical study there? You see, in that part of the world, the steward, it was a big landowner, and these farmers were out, these tenant farmers, and he went around and said, all right, at harvest time, <coughs> he calculates, that stuff is worth about 60 barrels of oil, make it 90, the other 30 are for him. And the master knows this, and that's the way they make money, that's the way the Romans, that's why the tax collectors were hated, because they did that on the taxes too. You owe the Roman government, you know, $4,000 this year. But that's not what he says. He says, you owe the Roman government four plus $2,000. The two is for me. That's why they were hated. So this guy, he sees what's coming, and he's willing to take a short-term loss in order to realize a long-term gain. And Jesus says, these guys are smarter than you are. I'm offering you eternal life, and you won't even take a hit on your ego. You see how wonderful he is? All right, so Jesus was born into a family. He liked families. How many of the people he healed were the children of people? You know, the widow of Nain, uh, the daughter of Jairus. I mean, how many, how many of his stories come around people, around families? So uh, there's that. And then there will be, well, I'll do this one first. The, uh, unbreakable nature of the marriage commitment. Now they test him because, see, in, in his day, there was two schools of thought, the stricter code, uh, you know, that, uh, and a wider code, or wider outlook on the code. They're trying to trap him. And so he said, what did Moses say? You know, he wrote that if a man wants to divorce his wife, he has to give her a bill of divorce. Why the bill of divorce? So she can prove she's marriageable again, to protect her again. Um, and Jesus says, that was given to you because of your hardness of heart, your disobedience, you will yield to my father. But the age of hardness of heart is over, I'm here. So there's no excuse anymore for that, period. Now the church in her mercy, why? Look, preparation for marriage begins at the cradle. And we don't prepare people to be committed to love, to lay down their lives. So after a couple of years, they get bored. The church has mercy on that, but that's, and what it really says is, that was never a marriage. That's what annulment means. But that's unnatural. We're gonna get through this if we just pray and let ourselves get renewed. But Jesus is saying, that's not the Father's way. And hardness of heart, it's over. I'm here, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to take you to heaven. Now, the, the, the technicalities in Matthew, the famous exception clause in Matthew, uh, it means consanguinity. I don't have time to prove all that now, but, and that's also arguing from, from um, Qumran. <clears throat> Zainut the word in, in um, Hebrew. Uh, but you have to take my word for it now because I don't have time to go into it all. You might mention just very quickly what the exception clause in Matthew is. Exception clause, well, you know, if a man sends away his wife except for, pornia is the Greek word, except for unchastity, except for whatever. You know, some sort of sexual aberration and it doesn't mean except that she commits adultery, which was an earlier understanding, and pornea can mean that. It means the pornea is that he should have never married her in the first place. She's too closely related to him. That happened a lot. In that part of the world, you know, the, the big thing in that part of the world is keeping everything in the clan. And so I marry my first cousin to keep everything in the clan, but I can't marry my first cousin God already told the Israelites you can't do that. And so, but people did it. And, and outside Israel, all the time they did it. And, and that's Pornia. There's a, there's a rabbinic injunction. If a man is a non-Jew and he wants to come in and become a Jew and he's married to his first cousin, he has to get rid of her, help her out, do whatever he wants, but he can't come in married to her. That's Pornia. Is that clear? You know, you do this all day. It's crystal clear. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but the other one is more interesting. 
<clears throat> does the incident in Mark 3 and the parallels, parallels means the other two synoptics, um, your, your mother and your brothers are out there and they want to talk to you. And this, while the wording is different in the three, slightly different, the idea is the same, isn't it? I think I've got Mark right here, uh, who's the toughest on all of this, by the way. Um, it's right in Mark, it's right after choosing the disciples. And I'll show you why in just a moment. And he went into the house and everybody gathered around him and then, um, you know, he's talking to them and then they say, um, you know, your people are out there and your mother and your brothers are out there and they want to talk to you. And he says, um, behold, my mother and my brothers, if anyone does the will of God, he is brother and sister and mother to me. And in doing that, he broke through millennia of this world's thinking about marriage. It's not just to keep the clan going, it's not just to keep the money in the clan, it's not just to have the glory of the, you know, the first quarterback in the clan or whatever. It's not what it's for. It's to bind you to me in your flesh so that we can all go to heaven together and that makes your marriage deeper and more fruitful and eternal. But now you belong to a bigger family. You belong to a messianic family. And that takes marriage and puts it in a whole new, potentially eternal context. And that's why all the time Paul says, Brothers, Adelphi, brothers, I want to write to you. That's not just like, you know, give me five, brother. You know? It's not that kind of brother. It's you and I are in the same messianic family. Jesus founded it. That's very important because you see, this marriage is not just a this world's reality. It's an eternal vocation. St. Catherine of Siena, all these people, the people we loved most in this life we will love most in the next life. Because they're bound to us. Okay. So that's some of our Lord's teaching on marriage, but then on the demands of discipleship. If we had one the other day. Luke is the toughest on this one. If anybody comes to me and doesn't hate, you remember the other day? His father and his mother and his sister and his brother and his wife and himself, he can't even be my disciple. You can't even make the cut. Whoa. Well, of course, everyone will tell us right away, correctly, that hate means love less. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. He didn't hate Esau. He loved him less. So you, I have to be first, is what he's saying. I got to be more important to you than your father and your mother and your wife and your sister and your brother and your children and your, and your own life. I have to be more important. Because I am the Son of God and I am your Savior. Now this is not pious talk, friends. This is the teaching of the Son of God. Now how do we do this? Only with the power of God. But it's part of the teaching on marriage. And you see where it's part of? It's part of this messianic family. It's part of this messianic family. Now, he goes on in that Lucan passage to say, if anybody doesn't give up all his possessions, he can't be my, renounce is the word he uses. Says it. All his possessions, he can't, well, then who's left? Aren't these the kind of things, this is just <coughs> scripture professor for 40 years trying to get you, when we get to those texts, you know what we do? We duck. <coughs> and we just hope maybe by Wednesday we'll forget it. <laughs> That's no way to read the word of God. That's not honest. I can remember once riding up to the, I've been helping out in the same parish for 22 years on the weekends. And I'm, this was the Sunday Gospel one Sunday, and I'm driving up to the parish, and I'm saying to myself, Lord, talking to the Lord, I said, Lord, look, let's be honest. How, what am I going supposed to tell these people? I'm not going to skate over this. This is for real. You meant this. What did you mean? And I heard him tell me, I mean that all that they own is under my lordship. And I want to be Lord of it. I expect them to raise children and to pay for their education and to feed them and clothe them. I don't mean they have to give all their money away. I mean, I want to be Lord of it all. I can run their vocation. I can take care of them. 
I want them because they belong to me. They're part of my family. Wouldn't it be great if we understood that and submitted our decisions? You know, we make them and then we kind of say, okay, God, I hope you like this one. And he's, these are beautiful texts about marriage. Now I'm going to take for the last whatever I've got time. I've got to watch here somewhere. Oh, not bad. I got to, the, the climax of all our Lord's teaching comes in a way of trying to make sure I didn't leave out anything. Well, the consequences. Well, I'm giving you some of those consequences. Um, if I had time, I'm going to take two minutes. There are three concentric circles that in case the Lord teaching in the New Testament. There's the Roman civilization with its laws, its roads, and so forth. That's the big context of this. Huh? At this time in Rome and the civilization dominated by Rome, marriage was in sheer disaster state. If you, read, if you want to be shocked and informed, read any of the stories or histories of Women, so few women could have children because they were trying abortions and were rendered fertile or just plain died. They didn't have our fancy ways of killing children, so they would take enough poison to kill the child, not enough to kill themselves. That's pretty tricky, so a lot died. And then the other barbarous methods. So the, the, the men whose wives were bearing children would lend their wives out to everybody else because you still wanted to keep the money in the family and, you know, Madness, huh? Tacitus, Roman historian in book five, lets out against the Jews because they never did abortion. At least they, it was against the law. And he calls them, listen to this. Sounds like something you'd hear in Congress. He, he calls them the enemies of mankind because they will not expose their children. Talk about a blind mind. That's part of the Roman world. There were exceptions. There are little inscriptions on sarcophagi sometimes to my beloved wife and my beloved husband. They were buried together and, you know, and some of it must have been sincere. At the same time, there were some great philosophers. One of my heroes is this Musunius Rufus, and uh, who said the only reason a man and wife come together is for the procreation of children. This is a pagan philosopher. So there was that in the culture. But then there's the in Musunius and in his crowd. That's the Greek thought. That's the, cent the inside circle. The big circle, Roman civilization, Greek thought, which permeated that whole world. And then, for our, what we're looking at now, the inner circle, the Jewish world. Almost all, I think, all of New Testament teaching on sexuality comes through the Jewish world, comes from the, the Old Testament and comes into this world. Even our Lord's thing, you know, if a man looks on a woman and lusts after her, you can find that in Job. So you see, it's that world. Now into that world therefore comes, and this is what I wanted to do, is I want to look quickly to reinstate for you in this understanding of the history of marriage. The text nobody wants at their weddings anymore. Because if you see the vision here, and then if I had two seconds, I was going to talk about celibacy, because that's also teaching on marriage. Um, in Ephesians 5, as you all know, there's this famous text. First thing you have to know is that um, the word here, uh, where the text starts, subordinating yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. That's the fifth of a whole list of participles describing life in the spirit. Singing, praising God, singing to one another, giving thanks to God, these are all participles. And so is this fifth one. Subordinating yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. Not submitting, subordinating yourselves. For all of those of you who flunked Greek, that means it's a middle voice. Ivotastes de. So, you know, people talk so many in, in this participle form. You see, subordinating, it's a free act. You've got to do it. 
Nobody's going to beat you up till you're submitted because that's not worthy of a Christian. Subordinate yourselves to one another. And then he goes on to apply that which applies to the whole community to this one relationship, family. Wives to your husbands. Notice he doesn't repeat the subordinate. I've got to tell you, if we had a month, we don't. This word, ipotas, this day, in all the literature, we had, if we lined up all the books, second century to, to first century BC to first century AD, they would fill those four or five chairs. The stuff written, Plutarch, Musonius, uh, Seneca, I can't go on and on. In all of that literature, this word, which is the only word used in the New Testament, for one exception, I'll even try to remember to tell you about, this is the only word used, and it only comes twice. This is not a pagan word for the way a wife relates to her husband. It comes in uh, uh, pseudo calisthenes Life of Alexander, and in Plutarch. There are other words, obey, be submissive, blah, 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 because the wife of the woman is considered inferior, not in his Christianity, based on that she's Asia. She's a helpmate. Without that, he can't be human. He can't be a friend. And so here, the, another word like it is agape. Agape was kind of a colorless word in Greek. Huh? And the Septuagint, the Greek translation, used it. But Christianity took that word and filled it with its own content. Because it had a miracle to talk about. God is love. You need a word. Where do you get a word? Do you go to Sanskrit or something? I mean, where are you going to get a word? So they took a word that meant affection and so forth, but and filled it with its own content. And if you watch closely, you'll notice in the New Testament, this word of God, this reality of God, never originates with a human being. It always originates with God. It's very important. And so, Another word like it is this one. Subordinate yourselves. Why? It's like Paul says in Philippians. You know, let everybody think of other people greater than themselves and, and, and strive for unity and want to serve one another and all that stuff. Or Galatians. You are free now, so be slaves to one another. To levotes, you know. Be a slave to one another. Because now you're free, you can do this. You're not forced, it's love. Or our Lord. If anybody wants to be first, let him be last. This is all this text is saying. Everybody's supposed to do this. Because a husband is head of his wife, that means uh, source as well as initiator. Just as Christ is head of the church. And how is Christ head of the church? He is savior of the body. Not as omnipotent incarnate word of God. Of course, he's head of everything a savior of the body. That's his headship. But just as the church subordinates itself to Christ, so too wives to their husbands in everything. There's one more word I should have gone back up there. Subordinate yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. Darn it, nobody translates it oh, out of respect for Christ. He means fear. Because fear is a precious thing. In First Peter, you know, explain your faith to people in fear. Because it's a sacred, marvelous thing you're doing. You're talking about the depths of reality that have been given to you. Given to you. You don't deserve it. Now share it, but in fear. I remember once talking to a woman about 60-something, and she said to me, I'm not very interested in, anymore, really, in relating to my husband sexually, but he's very interested. So I try very hard to be cooperative and loving and, because I fear. Now, she didn't mean that her husband was going to beat her up. It meant that, mystically, she understood this relationship and the sacredness of sexual intercourse. Compare that to the TV. You see? And so, uh, the reason I brought it up is it's there, and then the last thing it says about the wife is let her fear her husband. Again, it means look on this relationship 
in awe. Got nothing to do with being afraid of anybody. And that's it. I remember once I was a chaplain of a small community, they were doing this with some of the men, you know. We, and we were reading this text and I said, you know, geez, that's tough on the women. I said, you idiots. <laughs> Look at this text. First place, 75% of it is directed to the men, not the women. And it says, you have to die out of love for your wife. That's what it says. And that's the way Christians relate. Well, that's sanctity. Well, of course it's sanctity. What else is there? But why do we, what else have we got to live for? And being married is an infallible sign that you're called to sanctity. So I'm going to read just a little bit more, but I'm trying to sum up the New Testament teaching. Coming from Jesus, who gave the example, he married his wife, the church, by laying down his life for her. And that's the model. Okay. Husbands, love your wives. It's the only thing husbands are ever told to do in the New Testament. Love your wives. Once, I was going to say, in one text, in 1 Peter, it's the only time the wife has ever said that she should obey her husband. And Sarah obeyed her husband. Every other time that this was in Colossians and Timothy and so forth, every time this treatment of marriage comes, what they call the household order text, it says, subordinate yourself. Subordinate yourself out of love. And husband, subordinate yourself by laying down your life for your wife. Okay. Well, it's really, you know, I'm trying to create the environment because the words don't ring like this in our culture today. We look at every text with power-colored glasses. So this is a power struggle going on here between husband and wife. And the guy writing this text, he's for the husband. Read it! And don't forget, it is the Word of God. This isn't just, oh, I don't like this. Well, start your own religion. I mean, this is the Word of God. So it's got to make sense. Okay. And then, you know, that's why, you see, this mystery is great. What mystery? The mystery of Adam and Eve, finally realized, not now just in figure, but in reality, which is the, the marriage of Christ and the church. As a great German exegete says, uh, the, or spring, the, the original Adam is Christ. And this original wife is the church, his body. So it's a beautiful, exalted grasp of our eternal destiny. I'm going to quit. It's time. <clears throat> <clears throat>